If you would stand as we sing, Blessed Be the Name. I'm not Danny James. This is old school day, and in the old school, we used to direct the singing with our hands. That's second nature to me. So if it leads you off, I'm sorry. Just follow along. Y'all should know these songs. Tell your face you like these old songs. Here we go. There is a name I love to hear. y'all can have a seat for a minute. Just want to say welcome to Gillianville Baptist Church. We are so glad that you are with us 
this morning. We uh, do have a couple of our pastors out. It's summertime, so pray for them and pray for all of our church families. They're on the road enjoying a little bit of rest and, and vacation together with their families. do have some announcements for you this morning. Um, if you are a parent of a child who's going to our children's summer camp, uh, the camp heading to Orlando, we're going to ask that you guys meet with Pastor Rodney immediately following the service this morning in the children's building. So moms and dads of kids who are heading to camp with Pastor Rodney this summer, please uh, make your way over to meet with him. Uh, also, just want to let you know we're doing a few things a little bit different on Wednesday night. We're continuing to have our Wednesday night uh, supper through the summer this year, but two of our classes, our dad's class that meets in the fellowship hall room uh, one, and uh, one of our women's Bible studies that meets here in the worship center in room one, they're going to be combining uh, in a series that we're calling The Work and Art of Parenting. That's going to be meeting in worship center um, room number 34, so just right out the double doors across the hallway. So moms and dads, we invite you to come be a part of that uh, every Wednesday night this summer there at 6 o'clock. Also, moms and dads, I want to let you know that uh, VBS is back on the calendar this summer. Uh, it's going to be July 11th through the 14th. Our VBS is including our Drum Strum Hum Camp. We're putting them together to do Spark Plus. Uh, the Lifeway curriculum was music themed this year. We thought that would dovetail nicely with what we're trying to do in developing out our music education and discipleship program here at Gillianville. So that is going to begin at 9 a.m. Um, on July the 11th goes through the 14th, and every day it concludes at 2.30 in the afternoon. So a full day of activities for your kids, your grandkids, your nieces, your nephews. Make sure you go to Church Center to sign them up for it. Um, if you've been collecting uh, the baby bottles for our Alpha Pregnancy Centers, if you've been uh, adding coins and, and dollar bills and checks to that, those are going to be due on Father's Day. You can just return them here to the stage on left or right. Just uh, put the bo bottles there. We'll be collecting them um, and then last but certainly not least, as we get uh, ready to celebrate Father's Day together, circle Father's Day on your calendar if you forgot it, Danny is hoping to put together a men's choir. That's right. That's all guys. All guys. All these guys. All these guys. Those guys. Everyone. In that choir loft, and not none of the ladies, just them. So that requires some of you guys who might not be comfortable normally singing, I'm looking at you, and you, and you, and you, and you and you and not me, but you, um, we, we're asking you guys just to, let's have some fun with it together. Wednesday evening, the 16th, Wednesday the 16th, in the choir room, uh, immediately following our Bible studies for a rehearsal with Danny, just to make sure we're all on the same page. Looking forward to it together. Hey, again, we're so glad you're here this morning. Be praying for those who are uh, on the road traveling as we've been praying for you who are here to gather. And if you're with us online, thank you for joining us. Look forward to worshiping together. Pastor Roy? I don't need your notes. And if you can't sing, just come on and join the choir anyway. Those that can sing make the rest of us look good. All you got to do is move your mouth. If you can't remember the words, all you got to say is watermelon, watermelon. Everybody will think you're singing them. Would you stand, please? Take my life and let it be. <laughs> Thank you. 
Sharp, would you lead us in prayer, please? Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this opportunity we have as brothers and sisters in Christ just to gather together, to gather together, to sing, to worship, um, and to praise you. Uh, Father, I pray that you will just be with us today, be with those who will be leading us this morning. And Father, I pray that we will not just be hearers of your word, but also be doers in your word. Help us to go out this week and to reflect the goodness and the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Spirit of the
you know, some of you might be new enough of the church, to the church here at Gillianville to, to not know this, but uh, correct me if I'm wrong, guys, but Brother Roy's, one of his first assignments when he was called here almost 20 years ago uh, was to be our, our, our worship leader. How about that? You got, who remembers that? Man, some of you guys have been around for a while. I mean, I mean, some of y'all are getting old. I mean, not me, but, you know, some of y'all are getting. Oh, you don't you have to volunteer. You don't got to raise your hand. I said them, not us. Oh, man, but the older I get, I, I certainly am, am grateful for. You know, I can remember being a kid and um, watching dad and granddad go in for their first, you know, big medical scares. I, I remember granddad going in for for bypass surgery and just how awful of a procedure it was and then I as a pastor had the opportunity to to be in those moments be at those bedsides with a lot of folks a lot of you when you've gone through the same procedure and to watch through the years how the technology advances and how it certainly doesn't get any easier but boy it's not getting any worse I'm grateful as I age for those advancements in medicine. I can only imagine uh, a day when a doctor's only a doctor's only skill, is the only tools they had in, in treating a patient were to look at them and consider their their symptoms to. to to not be able to really look inside of the heart of the matter. I mean, if you can imagine, we went hundreds and hundreds of years practicing what we would describe as modern medicine before the simple x-ray came along. In fact, it was, it was 1895 before x-ray technology was discovered at all. Very quickly, they realized the medical application for it. So the very next year in Birmingham, England, for the first time, an x-ray was used in a surgical procedure. No longer did someone simply have to cut at a patient to explore to see what was going on and what was going wrong. They could now, almost without being invasive, look inside. And that technology has become safer and more advanced. So we have MRIs, we have uh, sonograms, we have, we have CT scans. I mean, we can, a doctor now has all these remarkable modern tools at their disposal to look inside. I can remember 20 years ago when I began making hospital visits, pastoral visits, it was not even then uncommon to have someone scheduled to go in for exploratory surgery. We don't know what's going on, so we have to cut now that just just never happens remarkable advances in technology making our lives a little bit easier the quality of our lives a little bit better the length of our lives a little bit longer because doctors don't simply give us a once up and once down and say i think this could be wrong with you they can look inside and see that's where we're going this morning. Several weeks ago, we were studying through the book of James. Um, we put pause on that for what I thought was a very important series and promised that we would go and we would wrap up that book. And I, I want to take a stab at that today. So if you have your New Testament with you, and I hope that you do, turn with me to James chapter 4. James chapter 4, as we continue our study in this epistle examining, discussing, exploring how our religion is from the inside out. So I want to read this passage, I want to pray, and then we'll get to work. James writes, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, 
Whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or, or do you suppose that it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? But he gives more grace. He gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he, he will exalt you. Father, I thank you for these words. They come from your scripture. They're your words to us. They're not static. They're not wooden. They're moving and they're alive. They're meant for us, for our instruction, for our shaping, to be conformed, to be more like Jesus. And that's why we're here. We've spent a week trying to be like Jesus, and now we're looking at a, another week and another set of opportunities to be like Jesus, and we want to be more like Jesus in the coming week than we were in the last. Lord, do it. We can't do it on our own steam or our own power, but you can empower us to make that a reality. So use your words this morning, Lord. Power and agency of the Holy Spirit that you allow to dwell in the hearts, the lives of those who believe. Use your words to conform us to the image of the beloved Son. Our Lord, our Savior, and our only hope of heaven, Jesus, in whose name we pray. And amen. So that's the premise. This is it. And it's, it's just that simple. Ours is an inside-out religion. Ours is an inside-out religion. It begins not with the trappings. And in fact, as I look around the room, I mean, this is a very, if we're talking about the history of the Baptist movement, as fledgling and as young as it is, just a little bit over 500 years now, uh, this is the sort of room that, that our forebears would worship in. It is, compared to other kinds of religions in the world, even other some Christian denominations, uh, an austere room. There, there's no statuary lining the walls. There are no icons lining the walls. There's hardly any art at all. Yes, there's a cross here and a cross there. The truth is, 200 years ago in a Baptist church, you probably wouldn't find even that. As we looked around 500 years ago in the throes of the Protestant Reformation, the thing that we would come to call the Protestant Reformation, those who would become the first Baptists said, we, we should remove everything around us, all the trappings around us that we can't find in Scripture, that doesn't match up to Scripture, that what's really important isn't the ceremonies or the rituals. It's, it's not the, the way that we, we decorate or the way that we celebrate. It's not the ceremonies we go through. It's not about an initiation. It's not about an ongoing sacrifice. It really is about you as an individual. Man, woman, boy, girl, husband, wife, student, child. Coming to, to see and to love and believe in Jesus as an individual. And we also understood that, that as it has been from the very beginning of the Christian movement, that Jesus intended us not to simply go through our discipleship process, this journey of life as individuals, but he knit us together in these beautiful little expressions of his kingdom, the local church. So we began to gather with like-minded people, stripping away all the trappings of religion to try to get to the heart of the matter. We haven't always done well at that. We've certainly failed. Ours is certainly not the only system, might not be the best system, but here we are. A group of believers this morning holding on to this. We're Christians not because of the ceremonies we gather to celebrate, the feasts or the holidays that we hold. We are Christians because God has made us and called us, and saved us as individuals, men, women, boys, girls, through the cross of Jesus. He has done something on the inside of the individual. 
made them whole, made them new, made them alive, though they were dead formerly in their sins and their trespasses. Ours is an inside-out religion, and yet the weight of religiosity bears on each and every one of us. It does. Because celebrating the expression of an inward transformation can be very, very hard. Celebrating an, an outward expression of religiosity, that's super easy. Religious ceremonies are incredibly easy. We need you to be baptized, no big deal. Take a bath in public, there it is. We need you to take communion together, a little wafer, a little bit of grape juice, we'll pass it out, you can take it after a moment of, of solemn, somber music with the, with the lights turned low, super easy. The ceremonies, the trappings of religion, the outward expression of religion is always easier than healthy introspection. Looking at our own hearts and our own minds and asking the question, have I believed? Do I belong? Am I being transformed by the work and the power of Jesus Christ through his cross? I love this little passage in James because it echoes and amplifies the difference between the outside and the inside, saying, yeah, we, there's, there's obviously an outside trapping. Uh, to, to, there's, look, sometimes we'll say, as, 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 this is in my notes, this is a sidebar, and I probably won't say it well because of that. We often say, we've heard it said, ours isn't a religion, it's a relationship. No, it's a religion. It is. We have ceremonies. We have gatherings. We worship together. We sing songs. We go through ceremonies. We have baptism and communion. There's the trappings of religion. Religion and what we do, that's true. Jesus was an anti-religion, but it's religion absolutely built on and predicated upon relationship. We belong to him who saved us. We've been adopted into his family because he died for us. We've been forgiven of our sins because he atoned for it on the cross. Yeah, it's a religion, but it's built upon, it's contingent upon Holy, that relationship that we have with Jesus through faith because of his great love and mercy and grace that's shown to us on the cross. So it has an outward expression. Obedience is an outward expression. It is. Yeah, we're absolutely called as followers of Jesus to be obedient to something. As we follow Jesus, it means we don't follow other things. As we follow Jesus, it means we don't maybe follow our own intuition or wants or dreams or desires. Sometimes we put things aside for the sake of Jesus. We want to be like him so we're not going to be like other people. It has all kinds of outward expression. But obedience alone is absolutely missing the point of what Jesus has done in us and wants to do in us and through us. James gets to that. Outside, he says, hey, there's quarreling and fighting. What's new? Why? Why do we quarrel and fight with each other? James says it has an inward origin. Passions are at war within you. Outward expression, that, that anger boils over into murder. Why? Inside problem, because you desire and don't possess. An outward expression, you fight and you quarrel. Why? An inside origin, you covet what other people have or who other people are. An outside expression, you, you don't have the things that you want. The inside origin of that is you don't ask. Your father in faith. You might ask, but you don't receive an outside expression. Why? There's an inside problem. Because you are wrongly motivated, asking only to satisfy your own desires and passions. Outward behavior. Outward behavior begins on the inside. Or to put it another way, Pollution spills out. Consider what Jesus says, and we're going to be taking a stroll through an awful lot of the New Testament and a little bit of the Old this morning. Pollution spills out. Consider what Jesus teaches us in Matthew 15, beginning in verse 10. 
where Jesus called the people to himself and he said to them, hear and understand. It's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person. You see the Pharisees and the scribes and the apostles or the disciples of other, of other rabbis were really concerned that maybe Jesus was allowing his disciples to skip out on ritual purification. It was huge in their religious system to, to go through the outward trapping of religion in order to purify yourself. It's where baptism comes from. It actually comes from a pre-existing uh, a series of pre-existing rituals within Judaism itself where you wash your hands before you eat and you cleanse yourself before you pray and you take these ceremonial baths um, before you, you do certain religious things. You, you were obsessed with being pure, being pure, being pure. And when you saw Jesus' disciples eating without purifying themselves, it caused a scandal it freaked them out jesus says it's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person but what comes out of the mouth this defiles a person then the disciples came and said to him do you know that the pharisees were, were offended when they heard this saying jesus answered every plant that my heavenly father has not planted will be rooted up let them alone they are blind guides and if the blind lead the blind both will fall into a pit but peter said to him explain this parable to us i love peter peter gets a bad rap peter doesn't understand something he says time out let's back up let's unpack that so he says explain the parable to us and jesus said are you also still without understanding do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled but what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart and this defiles a person for out of the heart comes evil thoughts murder adultery sexual immorality theft false witness and slander these are what defile a person but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile anyone understand as we walk through this process of discipleships too often we imagine that it is only about the outward expression of religion if in our minds in our imaginations discipleship ends with i'm in church i have my kids in church um, i volunteer a little bit i give a little bit um, boy that's not discipleship and it's important i'm glad you're here right? we were called to be together we should be together but that's not the end game or we imagine that maybe we're here together and we go through these religious motions and movements together, this outward trapping of religion, so that we'll be better people. That we imagine the point of discipleship, the point of Jesus is behavior modification. My kids won't talk back to me if they're in church. Yeah, I raised both my kids in church. I promise you that is not true. Even if it were how pitiful to stand before the Lord and say, Lord, I, I brought my children and I, I, I brought them to your house and I put them before teachers and I put them before our sisters and brothers in Christ for training. I, I, I had them here. We walked through it so that they would be better behaved. Behavior modification is not the point of the cross of Jesus. It is the transformation of the inner man because it's the inner man that is defiled. And all of our sin and all of that corruption and all of that rebellion pours forth from a sinful and wicked and broken heart. One that each of us possess from the moment we enter this world. Jesus came to change, to purify, to heal, to save what is really broken. Pollution spills out. So yeah, I'm, I'm worried about the world around us. Boy, this is not my notes either. I gotta quit doing that. I'm worried about the world around us. I'm worried about the culture that I'm, I'm raising my kids in. I'm worried about the culture my kids are gonna raise their kids in. I am. I pray for it. I'm anxious about it. But I cast that anxiety upon the Lord and trust Him with it because what is outside of the church isn't the thing that we should be most worried about polluting it. It's the sinfulness we're bringing to the table. Second, if you're taking notes, God's concern for us is from the inside out. So the first point, outward behavior begins on the inside. 
pollution spills out. Second point is this. God's concern for us is from the inside out. God wants our heart, not a show. I love the story of of that moment in, in redemptive history where God was ready to establish a king over his people, to rule over his people, to be a shadow of the great king, the great Messiah who was to come. Now, the people got anxious and jumped the gun, so they ended up with Saul, who was just a winner. But rather than chunking them as a people and moving in a different direction. God, a God of second chances, the God of redemption, a God of, of forgiveness um, says, no, 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 it's time to give them a king, to establish a king, a king of God's own choosing, a man who would be after his own heart. So he sends the, the great prophet Samuel to, to evaluate the sons of Jesse, and there they are, Dozen strapping young dudes, man, each one more impressive than the last. They're tall, they're strong, they're leaders, they're gunners. I mean, pick one of these dudes. You would want to introduce them to your daughter kind of guys. And how does the story go? Samuel gets ready to anoint each one of these winners. God says he's not the guy, he's not the guy, he's not the guy. Until finally we come to David, who's a shrimp little bit of a wimp. It's not impressive to the eye. He has none of the regalness, none of the sophistication. He's not a man of war. He's not a man other men would line up to follow. He is completely and utterly unimpressive. But the Lord said to Samuel in 1 Samuel 16, 7, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I've rejected him to the impressive young men. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the, what's the word? Heart. God looks upon the heart. If it's true for David, guess who it's also true for? You. Do what you will to impress him with all of the outward trappings of religion. Do what you will to impress him with all the outward flows of obedience and all the morality that you can muster in your flesh. Fake it till you make it, the adage goes. It might work in business, but when we stand before the Lord, in this moment as we sit here before the Lord, he sees through all of it, past all of it, and he sees who we really are on the inside. That's what he wants. He wants our hearts because he sees our hearts. He doesn't want the show because he, he can see through and past the show. That's why the prophet Hosea, writing powerfully in a passage quoted by Jesus on a couple of occasions in Hosea 6.6, 6, where the Lord says, For I desire, the Lord desires steadfast love. Not sacrifice. People imagine in the sacrificial system, God's really impressed that we kill animals. Look, I killed a goat for you, Lord. Look, I killed a bull for you, Lord. Look, I killed pigeons for you, Lord. As though the Lord who created the universe is expressly impressed that we took a minute to kill something that's of a little bit, we sacrificed something that's of a little bit financial worth or value to us. No, I desire love, steadfast love, and not sacrifice. I desire the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. God sees on the inside. He wants our hearts. He does not want the show. He is not impressed with it. It is why when it comes to the practice of our religion, the Apostle Paul was so quick to tell his friends living in the city of Corinth in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty seven, 27, a passage we read every single time that we take communion together. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord, that is communion, in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then. And so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. 
For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment upon himself. What's Paul aiming at? What's he getting at there? Thank you for making the effort to be here this morning. It's tough. Get out of bed, get the kids ready to get looking halfway presentable to get here at a reasonable time. It's, look, I know it's tough. It's tough to sit there and listen to me go on and on and on for 35, 45 minutes. It's tough. It is, because I've been there. I have to watch myself on video Monday morning. So I'm telling you, it's tough. And as grateful as I am, as moved as I am, it benefits you nothing before the Lord. Not one thing if your heart is not wholly his. And what's great is that's not a demand that should shake us. Like he genuinely wants your heart. That's not a tyrant king demanding sacrifice. That's a loving father who really wants to. Kids, do you know why your parents bug you on your cell phones when you're out? Do you know why when you were at camp they were blowing up your cell phone going, hey, I haven't heard from you, what's going on? Do you know why when you're out with your friends you're like, hey, I just checked on you in Life 360. What? And if you don't know about Life 360, moms and dads, we'll work on it. We'll get you there. Uh, just saw that you guys were over here. What, do you know why they're bugging you? It's not because they are tyrants trying to control or ruin your lives. It's because they, you know the answer, they love you. And they really genuinely like you. And they want to be in your life and involved in your life. And they want good for you. They don't just want good for you. They want what's best for you. So if your sinful moms and dads can love you and want to know you and be with you and want your best, how much more does your perfect father who is in heaven love you and want to know you and want what's best for you? You hear me? He wants your heart. And that is not bad news. That is good news. That is the best news. It's the best news because he sees your heart the way it is right now and he wants it anyway. Wow. If you're taking notes, number three and number four, and that's what will be done, but number three. This is why we emphasize conversion. This is why we emphasize conversion. Not because we're evangelicals and it's our tradition. Not because it's how we measure success or is our custom. We emphasize conversion because healing begins from the inside out. The thing that God wants to change about you first is not how you behave. It's not. Now, that changes in time. I believe that it does. Roy, I don't ask the same way that I did when I was 19 years old. I don't act the way I did when I was 25 years old. I hope I'm not acting the way that I acted two weeks ago. If you get my meaning. I hope that every day, little by little by little, I'm becoming more like Jesus. But that doesn't come through my own effort. It doesn't come through uh, continued and, 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 and striving towards uh, some picture of, of, of religious or spiritual or moral perfection. It comes out of this truth that I have been made alive in Christ Jesus because of the work and the sacrifice he did on the cross for me. And I love him. Like, there was a time I hated him, but he made me alive, and now I love him. And I want to serve him, and I want to be like him, and I want to reflect him. And I want to share his love and that message of hope with everybody I get the chance to. It's inside where the conversion happens. It's in the inner person that that begins, and everything else just spills out from it. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Paul tells his friends, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. We will never apologize for emphasizing that need for conversion. Because I can't. I, look, sermons or lectures or lessons from me or any pastor on this church or any celebrity pastor out there in the interweb is not going to make you 
a happier, better adjusted, more moral person. Because in all of our striving for that, we miss the point to begin with. I mean, it makes no sense to build a, a beautiful house and put it just right on top of South Georgia clay. Because the minute it rains, especially in my neighborhood, that water, man, just floats and rises. And anything on the surface, man, they get washed down to the retention pond. If you want to build a beautiful home, you better have a beautiful foundation. Rock-solid foundation. Otherwise, the stuff that we do, the stuff that we build, all the furnishings and trappings we put inside, it just gets washed away at the first whisper of rain. We begin with a new heart that he puts in us when we believe, when we repent, when we surrender our all to him. I'm terrified. And I said this to our moms and dads Wednesday night. I'll, I'll repeat it here. I'm terrified of the prospect that we're here to raise our kids in church. I want us to move away from that language, I do. I've seen a lot of kids raised in church. I mean, you know, before I came to you guys, I worked in with college students and off and on for about 10 years. And before that, actually in between moments of working with college kids, I worked with teenagers. I was a youth pastor for off and on the better part of 10 years. That's 20 years of my adult life. I spent working with kids like yours, grandkids like yours, kids like you. And those ugly national statistics that 8 out of 10 or 9 out of 10 really don't stay engaged in a local church. They don't continue a process of discipleship after they leave high school, after they leave home. I've seen those numbers just bear out to be true. And I really, I really wonder if the heart of it isn't that those, those good church kids, we, we simply committed to raising them in church, that we wanted to change who they were on the outside, do the religious stuff. That we wanted to change maybe even how they behaved, behavior modification. That we were content with that, change how they act, and change where they are on Sunday mornings, Wednesday nights. If we transform that, that will be enough and we built their lives. Moms, that's we built their lives on sand. So, so let's be done with raising our kids in church. Let's just say no to raising our kids in church. Let's begin raising our kids in Christ. That means moms and dads, you have to be born again. Like you have to be converted and committed to your journey of discipleship. That means that, hey, aunts and uncles, you have to be born again. Right? Cool aunt, we need cool aunts and uncles to be red hot on fire for Jesus. So when the kids ignore me as dad, they'll look to you and they will be inspired. We need as many genuine disciples of Jesus around our next generation as we can cram into this room. We need to raise them in Christ. Lest it be said of us that all we did was have a generation of religiously indoctrinated unbelievers raising a generation of well-behaved pagans. This is why we emphasize conversion. This is why we emphasize personal devotion. I, I, I want to land here. I want to land here. This is why we emphasize personal devotion. While it's true that God heals us from the inside out, God also grows us from the inside out. As Jesus is absolutely giving a dressing down to the Pharisees in Matthew 23, in the middle of it, he says this in verse 25, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, religious leaders, you hypocrites, for you 
for you clean the outside of the cup and the plate. It's an illustration from the kitchen sink. No one in here argues with your spouse or your kids about washing dishes, do you? Only me. I'm the only one. Got a teenage son at the house. I'm trying to teach him right now how to clean dishes so when he goes to college, his roommate doesn't murder him in his sleep. Because you've all gone to the dishwasher or worse, you've gone to the cabinet when you had teenagers at home because we're all adults and we don't do it this way and you reach to grab a bowl for your cereal and you reach to grab a spoon and you look in the bowl and you look at the spoon that you got out of the cabinet or the dishwasher and what do you see? Caked on, dried on green stuff. I don't know what it was. Maybe it was once food, but it's not food anymore. It is now calcified, solidified gunk that's keeping me from enjoying my Fruit Loops. Jesus looks at the Pharisees of his day and he says, you're like a cup that's been washed on the outside. Hold it up. It's pretty. It's pristine. It's clean, right? But inside, they are full of greed and in self-indulgent. The outside of the cup is clean. The inside of the cup is grimy. Let me ask you, if it's clean on the outside and grimy on the inside, is the bowl clean? No, it's filthy. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate that the outside may be clean. Where does this, where does this journey of raising our kids in Christ begin? It begins moms and dads, aunts, uncles, grandma, granddad, sisters and brothers in Christ, it begins in your personal devotional habits and time with the Lord. I probably don't emphasize this enough. We probably don't discuss this enough. Because I'm afraid maybe that we talked about like quiet times in a do a quiet time. And when you come to Sunday school, you get a little star by your name, kind of third grade as I grew up in church way of thinking about it. But the truth is, your personal time with Jesus is probably, no, it's not probably. Your personal time with Jesus is absolutely the most important thing about your walk with Jesus. Why? Because again and again and again, from the teachings of Jesus or his apostles, throughout the teaching of the prophets in the Old Testament, we see, we've seen already that God wants our hearts, not our outward working. So if the most important thing about our being religious, walking with Jesus, is the outward stuff that we do, the religious outward stuff that we do, he's not impressed with that. Jesus says when you pray, don't do it in public, but go into a private, secret place and pray. We ought to do that. When you fast, don't do it in a way that people can see you and celebrate it. Do it in a way that nobody knows it's going on. When you do the religious things, the things that we do to get close to Jesus, do it on our own and in private and with regularity and with frequency and with zeal and with, because that is where and how we grow. Yeah, it gets just as simple as we need to be a church that prays more. And that doesn't mean carving out more time in a single hour and a half on a Sunday morning for public prayer. That means that we, you, me, when we leave this place, just need to pray more. For us and for you and for they and for he and then she and then them. Especially for them. Especially for them. Why? Because God grows us from the inside out. Not from the top down. Certainly not from the stage forward. Charles Spurgeon, when, when asked by um, a fan, um, it's a weird thing, about the power and the fieriness of his preaching and the size of the Metropolitan Tabernacle and the fame and esteem of that little church that he was giving leadership to. When asked, where does it come from? 
didn't beat himself on the chest. And he said a funny thing about fire. Fire ascends. From the pew up. Father God, I thank you for my friends in the room. Their families, this little family of faith that we get to be together. I thank you that our religion is from the inside out. So Lord, work on my inside. And work on theirs the person who doesn't belong to you or believe in you. I mean, today could be the day, the moment where their faith is tr given to you. They trust in you for the first time. How remarkable would that be? For those who have grown cold or calloused or hardened, I mean, you can do it again. You can melt a heart of stone you can revive passion that's long gone you can make us love you again and more how amazing would it be if you began that today for those of us who've just simply grown sloppy in our in our time with you lord just renew a passion and an interest and a hunger to talk to you in prayer, to hear from you, in the study of your word, to be with you, not just when we're around other Christians, but be with you and walk with you daily in communion with you. Revitalize, renew, inspire our personal devotion. And Lord, what you begin with us, take it beyond. And do with us as you will. We pray this in Jesus' name. And as we stand together to sing one last song. Here we go. church family as we um, close our time today. I, I hate saying goodbye. I, I do. I'm, I'm terrible at goodbyes. Um, and we've got to say goodbye uh, this morning to some folks who have been part of our church family uh, for years now, uh, who have just meant an awful lot to an awful lot of us. And I'm, I'm going to invite just two families to come forward if I can at this time. Is that going to be okay? Uh, I just want to ask the McCaskills to come on down, Ed and Tammy, Ezekiel and Devante is not with us, but had just graduated, you know, uh, last year and so proud of of him and what he's doing. Guys, it has been such a joy um, to be your pastor. Um, we know that uh, particularly in military life, uh, God calls you um, to moves you forward as uh, the core moves you forward in life. And as you move towards retirement, it's well earned and well deserved. Uh, it's been a joy to get to know you, to pray for your family. Uh, we just can't say that enough. So we just want to pray for you um, as you depart on this next leg of the adventure, um, if we can do that. I also want to ask Ruth to come down Ruth Gould and Wallace is coming down with her too. But you guys mind? Can we pray for you? I... Yeah, come on, Wallace. Stand with Ruth. Ruth and Todd um, are also uh, being transferred out. Todd's taking a new position. And uh, this is your last Sunday with us as well, correct? So come on down and I'm going to ask the Wallaces to be with you all. Um, these, these families have meant an awful lot to me. Uh, it's been a joy to be your pastor and 
and, and I know right now is a difficult time, but we're praying for you. Uh, and we want to pray for you now as you make this transition. So, church, if, if these folks have just been a blessing to you as they've been a blessing to us as a church family, would you just let them know right now? Amen. And uh, I'm going to ask Brother Roy to, to close us in a, in a word of prayer for these families and a benediction. And, um, you know, it's, it's flu's going around, so we're not going to come to a, a big line. But certainly, if you want to let these folks know uh, today or in the days ahead through communicating, reaching out to them, let them know that you're praying for them as they make these moves. Please do. Heavenly Father, we come to you today, and we do pray a blessing on these families, Lord, as they go from here. We thank you for the blessing they've been to us, and Lord, as we continue to pray for them in the coming days, that they will be strengthened and find a church home where they're going, that they can be involved in your kingdom. Lord, bind us in your love today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you all.